Welcome everyone to the Damage Report on a fantastic Friday. I'm Francesca Fiorentini. So happy to have you with us here. Uh, and with me is not Brett. No, no, no. We've got someone better. <laughs> Sorry, Brett. Shots fired. It's Yasmin Khan, Rebel HQ uh, extraordinaire, crushing it over there. Um, Yasmin, how you doing on this Friday? I'm doing very good. I'm sorry that I'm not Brett, but also not sorry to be here on a Friday with Francesca. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to be taking over Fridays in October, and we've so we get to do garbage people. I'm so very excited. You, yeah, yes, I know you've exciting. got your garbage person. I've got my garbage person, and then we got a lot to get to. There's of course Trump legal updates. This was that first week of his uh, financial crimes trial in New York. So there's even more unfolding on that. Some speakership updates. Will he, won't he? <laughs> in terms oh of, God. you know, will Trump um, sort of come together and say, I will pick up the mantle. Steve, uh, Jim, don't you worry. Uh, so we'll, we'll find out about he's that. He's a hero, friend. So hopefully we'll he's see. He's stepping in in a time he loves of need. to step up when he's needed. Absolutely. Uh, and then probably a, a low light, maybe one of the lowest lights of the Biden administration thus far, just happening um, yesterday when it comes to his decision about uh, the border wall. Looks like he's continuing it. Uh, and then yeah. this is an incredible story you guys have to have to stick around for, which is about um, the the group that was behind the Supreme Court case of the Colorado wedding website creator that effectively allowed discrimination to take place once more. LGBTQ plus people no longer protected because the First Amendment rights of bigots are more important. So said the Supreme Court last they were in session. So we're gonna dig into that group because there's a lot you need to know about what they've been up to. But if you're here, you know what to do. You like in the stream, you're sharing the stream right now, letting know, letting people know what you do on a Friday. You're sending in the super chats and the comments. Uh, it keeps Yasmin and I going. I will read them during the social breaks. But um, with all that, Yasmin, are you ready to dig in? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Am I? No, for Jessica, you're not actually. No, no, I am. I am. Let's go. <laughs> We're in it together. We'll do it. We'll do it. So. Trump's legal problems, of course, are only getting worse. Uh, and specifically in this civil fraud trial in New York, uh, when it comes to the overinflation of his assets. So saying that he was worth way more than he actually was. Um, we know that the judge, Arthur Engeron, um, has not only ruled that uh, he might need to pay $250 million. Um, we're now sort of haggling about exactly how much that will be in this trial, um, but that he's trying to prevent Trump from taking any steps to move any of the money that he still has outside of the Trump organization. Um, which again, if this trial goes the way we think it might, might actually have to effectively shut down. So he issued a new ruling on Thursday morning. This is the judge ordering that all the defendants named in the lawsuit to provide a list of all the entities they currently own and to what extent any third party may have an ownership or interest in those entities. They must also provide advance notice for the creation of a new entity and any anticipated transfer of assets or liabilities to any other entities. In other words, let me know if the Trump team is trying to move their money around and trying to save whatever they have um, so that you know we can't come collect as uh, the state of New York. Um, Trump and his two eldest sons, Don Jr. and Eric, former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg and the Trump Organization controller, Jeffrey McConney, will have a week to disclose all the information to the former federal judge, Barbara Jones, the court appointed monitor currently overseeing the company's finances. So we got another judge, I'm sure that Trump is going after in addition to Letitia James who brought these charges. In addition, of course, to Judge Engeron himself. One of the reasons that the judge is doing this, and this is pretty much, I think, one of the funniest pieces of news I've I've come across in a while, but also very predictable, is that when when Letitia James were brought these charges back in September of last year, the Trump Organization immediately started Trump Organization 2 in order to move money into that new entity. The new company was registered with the New York's Department of State 
On September 21st, public records show the very day the state attorney general, Letitia James, filed a 220 page fraud lawsuit against him, his family and the Trump organization. So we see what you did there, very, very clever, but no, you can't do that. Um, there's new questions now as to whether Trump can move some of his money to Melania, who's not a defendant in this case. Um, but her former chief of staff actually said that um, she'd be unlikely to do that uh, unless she was granted major control or power. And you know, Donald Trump probably didn't give his wife, especially not Melania, any kind of financial control over everything. That's why she's got sort of the permanent resting bitch face. Um, but also, she's married to Donald Trump. But anyway, Trump's Big mad <laughs> earlier, I believe this was yesterday. Yeah, earlier yesterday, he tweet or he bleated. My bad. Uh, the racist attorney general. Yes, racist. We're we're back to Letitia James. Back to Letitia James. Racist attorney general of New York convinced a New York judge that Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach was worth 18 million when it may be worth a hundred times that. I love the maybe. They juggled my numbers in a fraudulent manner in order to make their fake case against me believable. This ridiculous suit should immediately be dropped. Appellate division should intercede. These people like Jack Smith are deranged. Thanks for reminding us about your other court case. He goes on, the ridiculous AG case against me in New York brought by the racist and, racist and incompetent Peekaboo James, which I'm like, what is that? What does that even refer to? Crime, crime, crime. This is a S show, blah, diddy, blah, 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 wine, wine, wine. So Yasmin, this makes a lot of sense to me that this judge Engeron would move uh, make sure that all of the entities are accounted for, would make sure that he was alerted were any money to be moved. But it's also a little bit like um, raiding Mar-a-Lago after five months of telling Trump that they were gonna raid Mar-a-Lago. Feels like he might have already moved the money. Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, it is. I that is one of the things that when anytime there's like a legal team dealing with Trump, it's like, you guys got to be more quiet and more stealthy about what you're doing because everything that he, that Trump is at least aware of, he's going to try to w wiggle his way out of things. We already know that. Yeah. What it kind of reminds me of is whenever companies will hire hackers to like intentionally try to hack their system to find security flaws and find all the loopholes and the holes and everything. Trump is like that, right? So in this whole Trump saga, the whole, you know, let's say since 2015, since we've been dealing with Trump as a politician, at least, as opposed to as a businessman. But, you know, in this whole time, he's challenged so many things in the legal system, in business, in the judicial system. And all these people have to be better at their jobs because of it, right? They have to come out and take all these additional precautions that before they just didn't think that they had to do because nobody was challenging these systems in the way that Trump has repeatedly tried to challenge them. So at least they're doing this little bit now. But it's like what you were saying, you know, is it too little too late? We already know that Melania Trump, his wife, has just renegotiated her prenup with Trump for the third time, setting up a trust <laughs> for their son and making sure that her money is okay, making sure that her son's money is okay because she sees all of his money flying out the window with all these legal cases. Oof, good for her. God, what a, that's a very smart move. Makes up for the jacket. We forgive you, Mel. Uh, no, look, I think what's interesting also about this case is that it's, you know, it's not the first time that a white collar criminal has been um, brought to justice. But it's one of a handful. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't happen that often that someone who just brazenly lies about their finances, if they are a big player in a like in the business world, if they're a massive celebrity, they get away with everything. That's exactly what happens. And yeah, they can move their money around, right? It's again, it's just like it, we're just going through the motions here. But again, I think. Because of the high profile nature of this, because it is Trump, and because it is Letitia James who doesn't seem to be um, giving an inch here. Although this is now out of her hands. This is what she recommended. Now it's in the hands of these judges, um, which is fun because he keeps on going back to her because she's a black woman, so why not? Um, but it's like, it is nice to see that finally a white collar criminal is uh, facing the music, just a little bit, and we shall see. He can still do business in Florida, people, if his if Trump organization gets shut down. You know, Ron DeSantis will absolutely allow him, you know, hey, build a hey, Trump Disneyland. Let's go. Trump land. We can ride. Look, you, <laughs> I don't even want to think about the rides.
some of the sensitive documents that Donald Trump uh, kept and retained, not only physically, but also up here, whatever he can hold up there in his brain, uh, and and how he leveraged it or discussed it, specifically when it comes to nuclear weapons, and in this case, nuclear subs. Uh, so there's new reporting, um, thanks to a disclosure from Jack Smith's team, um, that. Months after leaving the White House, former President Donald Trump allegedly discussed potentially sensitive information about US nuclear submarines with a member of his Mar-a-Lago club, who happened to be an Australian billionaire who then allegedly shared the information with scores of others, including more than a dozen foreign officials, several of his own employees, and a handful of journalists, according to sources familiar with the matter. I have more to say on Australia and maybe Yasmin could weigh in. But um, so prosecutors and FBI agents have interviewed this gentleman uh, whose name is Anthony Pratt. Um, He runs a uh, Pratt Industries, which is a big packing company, I believe. Um, In those interviews, Pratt described how looking to make conversation with Trump during a meeting at Mar-a-Lago in April 2021, he brought up the American submarine fleet, which the two had discussed before. Hey, remember that thing that you probably weren't supposed to tell me that you don't even tell me more? Tell me it again, Trump. According to Pratt's account, as described by the sources, Pratt told Trump he believed Australia should start buying its submarines from the United States. To which an excited Trump, leaning toward Pratt as if to be discreet, then told Pratt two pieces of information about US submarines, the supposed exact number of nuclear warheads they routinely carry, and exactly how close they supposedly can get to a Russian submarine without being detected. Um, interestingly, later that year, Australia decided to purchase, actually, interestingly, later, earlier this year, excuse me, Australia wound up purchasing submarines from the United States. Now, they're not uh, nuclear powered or they don't have nuclear warheads, supposedly. Um, but still, Interesting, uh, the strings that they could pull. A Trump spokesperson said, President Trump did nothing wrong has always insisted on the truth and transparency and acted in a proper manner according to the law. Yet too much transparency, bro, too much. Um, Here's my thing, Yasmin, with this story is that why is it always Australia? Am I wrong in remembering that George Papadopoulos was like running his mouth in some pub in Europe, I believe to an, an Australian like, diplomat about like the Ukrainian government about Trump basically putting the squeeze on Zelensky at that moment, which led to the the entire first impeachment. Like, shut up, you guys, shut up. You could like do your crimes, but shut up about it if you don't wanna get caught. Anyway, thoughts on this uh, just sort of braggadocious show and tell moment. It's so funny that you mentioned that about Australia because I forgot about that, but yeah, I think you're right. That I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about Australians and why they're so involved <laughs> in our politics. We already it's know the about accent. the Murdochs. Like they're very like, why are you so obsessed with us, Australia? But <laughs> as far as like Trump being braggadocious, Trump reminds me of a child who knows something and just wants everyone to know that he knows something. You know, he overheard the grown-ups talking and he's like, Oh, I know a thing. I literally did that when I was a child. You know, I remember my <laughs> I knew about my mother's 40th surprise birthday party and I let everyone know that I knew something, you know. <laughs> but Trump is a very old man and he should know better. He should be acting a little bit more responsibly. And then as far as, you know, being trustworthy and being transparent with all this information, no, there's a difference between discerning what is need to know information and what isn't and being transparent. You know, being transparent doesn't mean that everyone needs to know everything about everything. And as someone who was and is looking to be again the president of the United States, they should have more mental intelligence, you know, just like emotional intelligence to understand the difference between those two things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's like if he's doing this with anyone just Again, it's like if you're a member of the club, you're a paying member, he automatically sees that as you're in my circle. You're my friend. You already paid to be to be here, to be close to me, next to me. Um, And so why not? Like, you know, you've already paid for my loyalty. So I'm going to give you this piece of information. You're a billionaire who has a massively important company. Um, So who else is he telling other things too. And who else are the members of Mar-a-Lago, right? Who are just paying to basically get close to Trump and like get some secrets. The guy needs to shut up. Like it's it's almost like we shouldn't have voted for him for president in the first place, yes. But I don't I don't know. 
Uh, that's just my feeling. Um, but anyway, much more in the Jack Smith case and the documents case. It'll be very, very interesting how all of this plays out. And I feel like we're gonna find out a lot more about the secrets that he spilled. If they both can't get to 218, we need to have somebody that can unify our conference. Even if even if it's for the 45 days, 60 days that we're in this, trying to pass this um, this this funding issue, we need to have somebody that can unite the party. Everybody can get behind. And wouldn't it just be sweet to all these Democrats who kicked out our former speaker that they got rid of Kevin McCarthy and now they have to deal with President Trump? Imagine. Okay, so much BS there from Representative Greg Stube. Uh, the funding issue, the continuing resolution, your budget. Um, remember that, that's your job. Um, and he's at once saying the Democrats kicked Kevin McCarthy. The, Dem- the Democrats didn't kick Kevin McCarthy. You guys kicked Kevin McCarthy out. The Democrats just stood by and watched you do it. They voted for their speaker. You guys didn't vote for yours. Um, but there he is saying, wouldn't it be sweet? If Donald Trump just became speaker, and as we've talked about before on this show, Donald Trump says he has no interest in becoming speaker. Or does he? Wait a minute. Okay, if you ask nice, interestingly, yesterday he spoke with Fox Digital and said this. They have asked me if I would take it for a short period of time for the party until they come to a conclusion. And I'm not doing it because I want to. But I will if necessary, should they not be able to make their decision. Trump stressed that if Republicans can't come to a consensus, he would take the speakership for a short 30, 60, 90, 5,064 day period. Um, So that was a fun little moment, him saying, well, I guess if the party needs me, I would step in. Yasmin, he can't not like Flattery, again, flattery will get him everywhere. Yeah, and I, what, what's sad about that is that everyone else knows that about him. I wonder if he even knows that about himself. And he's like, yeah, just flatter me and I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll say whatever you need me to say. What a weird way to be controlled by just a mass of people, right? And the Republicans, this whole thing with blaming the Democrats for for ousting Kevin McCarthy is very funny to me, especially because one of your own guys, Matt Gates, is the one who started all this in the first place. It was the Freedom Caucus who did this. We know that. Everybody knows that. But what's frustrating is that they go on Fox News and they keep saying the Democrats did it, the Democrats did it. And then that's the only piece of information that's left in the minds of their viewers. The Democrats did it. I don't know how they did, but they did it. Mm-hmm. So. You know, that's all very frustrating. And then Trump talking about like he's going to be the next Speaker of the House. He's not going to be the next Speaker of the House, but this is fun for him. So I guess let him have his fun. Right. And and of course, this I'm sure is making Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan very uncomfortable, both of whom have been asked point blank. Do you support Donald Trump? And they're like, I mean, but conversely, right? Trump has now come out and endorsed Jim Jordan for speaker. So he's like, I'll I'll, I'll do it if you need me to. But also Jim Jordan's fine. Well, let's get there because after he said that to Fox, he did bleat what exactly we're talking about, which is he supports Jim Jordan for it. So this was a, it's a very long bleat. But all you need to know is the very end, which is he will be a great speaker of the house and has my complete and total endorsement. That is Jim Jordan. And he was right to look the other way at Ohio State when multiple wrestlers said that they were being sexually assaulted for years. Um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, other Republicans are also lining up behind Jim Jordan, uh, Lord Boebert, Thomas Massey, and more than 15 others. Um, interestingly, one notable former Republican Congresswoman, uh, that is Liz Cheney, pretty much eviscerated the idea of Jim Jordan as speaker. Um, take a look. Jim Jordan knew more about what Donald Trump had planned for January 6th than any other member of the House of Representatives. Jim Jordan was involved, was part of the conspiracy in which Donald Trump was engaged as he attempted to overturn the election. And if the Republicans decide that Jim Jordan should be the Speaker of the House, there would no longer be any possible way to argue that 
a group of elected Republicans could be counted on to defend the Constitution. Okay, but like, how bad is that? You know what I mean? Like, is it even a great document? Anyway, no, I'm kidding. Obviously, that's very scary coming from Liz Cheney. And effectively, what she's saying, which maybe folks disagree with, is um, it can get worse than Kevin McCarthy. And Jim Jordan is worse than Kevin McCarthy. I personally, and Yasmin, I don't know how you feel about this. I don't know how, especially without control of the Senate and without the White House. If those two things were different, yeah, absolutely, I would be scared. But Kevin McCarthy did everything that Republicans, extremist Republicans, including himself, including election deniers who are still in office like Jim Jordan, people who, yeah, supported both the coup attempts inside of the political process and outside of the political process on January 6th, like Jim Jordan, but also, you know, like Kevin McCarthy. Like, I don't know what the difference would be. Are we gonna be still be impeaching? Uh, Joe Biden, yes. Are we still gonna be kicking Democrats off of their committee positions? Yes, like what else is there? And look, maybe I'm asking a terrible question because there's a lot that I don't know that a speaker can do. But Jordan or McCarthy, I'm still scared. And either way, in that role of leadership, what's Jim Jordan gonna, what, what's he gonna? He's, his responsibility is to still fund the government. That's the priority number one for whoever steps into this responsibility and this role. So what is he gonna do? Like, nope, we're not funding it until we instate Donald Trump as president of the United States. Goodbye. Like, I don't know. It's like fantasy world here. Yeah, I mean, functionally, uh, again, and you want to be careful with these kind of questions, friend, because it <laughs> makes me very nervous to speculate about how something could be worse. But yeah, I think functionally, we'll see a lot of the same things happen under maybe Speaker Jordan as we would under Speaker McCarthy, because as we've seen, McCarthy was very much being controlled by some of the more extreme members of the Freedom Caucus and just the Republicans in general. So I think that'll be interesting going forward. Interesting is like a nice way of saying kind of it, it'll be terrifying to see. Um, I think another thing to not underestimate is the uh, the impact that rhetoric can have. Uh, Kevin McCarthy says a lot of terrible things, but Jim Jordan says a lot of worse things. And I think by normalizing some terrible words and things that are, you know, making certain things okay to say out loud, uh, Jim Jordan is dangerous in that sense. Yeah. And then additionally, uh, I think that we'll see somebody who, like Jim Jordan, really, really wants the speakership. And anybody who wants that much power, I think is somebody who you have to be very, very wary of. Yeah. I mean, in fact, they've said that they want to choose someone who doesn't want it. You're know, like, in an ideal world, yeah, I think anybody who covets that much power, I'm very suspicious of. I'm very skeptical of people. I don't trust people in general, though. So maybe you know, I'm an extreme version of that. But anyone it is, who wants yeah. it too bad, I'm like, why? Why do you want it so bad? It's true. It's it's very true. But I also think it's in, as we've seen an incredible responsibility. There's so much work involved. You actually have to make good on the promises. You have to make good on the compromises. You have to compromise. You have to work behind the scenes. McCarthy couldn't even do that when it came to not voting him his own self out of the yeah. seat of speaker. That's what a terrible speaker he was. Yeah. Um, so we will see. I feel like it is, it's a double edged sword. It's a curse as much as it is a position of power. But let's take our first break, guys. There is a lot more on the other side of this. Welcome back to the damage report. <laughs> I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini, in for the lovely dragon daddy, John Idarola, sending him so much Friday love, of course. And here with me is Yasmin Khan, ready to jump into this next story and a bunch more. Um, let's go. Let, let's let's unpack this. So Obviously, since the ousting of Kevin McCarthy, all eyes are not just on this empty speaker seat, but they're also on Matt Gates, the guy who single-handedly forced this motion to vacate, um, vacate the speakership. What does Matt Gates want? What is he doing? Uh, Matt Gates is often peacocked as sort of an independent thinker, a guy who doesn't take big money, a guy who uh, is against corruption, right? Uh, who wants like term limits, which maybe we, some of us agree with him on actually. But it's really important to understand that while Matt Gates claims that he doesn't take big money. He's absolutely gunning for big money. He's gunning for it in his own current race, but also potentially in future races if he runs as he seems to want to run for governor in the state of Florida. Um, 
to say nothing of the fact that he might be doing all of this to get away from any ethics investigations into his own past conduct, which is pretty effing serious. But anyway, there is new information, thanks to the Daily Beast, um, that there was a fundraising phone call uh, hosted by Steve Bannon. And the Daily Beast obtained this video conference call uh, organized by the Stop the Steal fundraiser, Carolyn Wren, in which Gates buttered up right wing sugar daddies off the record with off the record details about private conversations he'd had with former President Donald Trump. The most interesting part of the video, however, was the way Wren advised donors to use their wealth to bend Republican lawmakers to their wills. And Gates was right alongside her in doing that. So in other words, he says he doesn't believe in utilizing big money. He's super oh, small dollar guy. In fact, he's been fundraising off of this week in the fact that he you know, single handedly effectively or with other Republicans was able to get McCarthy out of his speakership. But here he is behind the scenes saying, I have the line to Donald Trump if you know, you can use your money to do X, Y or Z. And one of those those ways that he used his money was uh, to get a Republican representative to vote no on the continuing resolution. In other words, stop funding the government, shut it down. Um, and he did that through Carolyn Wren, again, the Stop the Steal organizer, who texted um, to one of the donors, would you write a max donation to her, her being this represent Republican representative? We don't know their name. Take a screenshot, send it to her and say, I'm only doing this because you're bravely standing up against the CR, the continuing resolution. Um, and that worked. So effectively, a big dollar donor that Carolyn Wren and Matt Gates cajoled into voting no on the continuing resolution, kind of arguably trying to tank Kevin McCarthy. Uh, they were able to effectively do that. Yasmin, we were talking about this before the show started because it's a little bit of a convoluted story. Um, and we'll get into why Matt Gates is absolutely not like a small dollar donation guy. Um, but here he is, right? He's trying to use big money donor leverage, his leverage with Donald Trump, which I don't know how much he has, to undermine Kevin McCarthy and to undermine the entire government. Yeah, so he's definitely trying to convince people that he does have a lot of leverage with Donald Trump. Uh, he's making it seem like him and Donald Trump are very much in cahoots as far as everything that Matt Gates is putting forth in Congress, including trying to oust uh, the speaker from the position of speakership. So there's a few different things going on here. Uh, right now, after uh, Matt Gates brought that vote out to get Kevin McCarthy out of the speakership, all of the Republicans are coming after Matt Gates now, attacking him for various reasons, while also blaming the vote on the Democrats, right? So they're saying they're bringing up things with Matt Gates and his past with underage girls. And they're also saying, you know, you're fundraising off of what you did. So you had a political and a financial motivation for doing what you did for bringing this up in the first place. And he's saying, you know, yeah, I'm a grassroots politician. Most of my money comes from these small dollar donations from my actual constituents, not from you know these big moneyed interests like the rest of you. I don't grovel for big money like the rest of you do. But as we've seen from this leaked audio from a Zoom conference that was organized by Matt Gates and a uh, representative Rosendale of Montana, uh, on this call, that's exactly what he was doing is he was courting these big money donors. Yeah. So now the question is going forward, why is he doing this? What is this actually for? And there is some speculation, maybe he's trying to just strengthen the Freedom Caucus and try to you know, get some more money to his fellow Freedom Caucus members, or he's trying to uh, secure larger donors for maybe his governor run in 2026, which is as of right now, just a rumor, or if he really is just doing whatever Trump is asking him to do and solidifying all those donors, because he's gonna need a lot more than $20, $30 here and there to do whatever he wants to do next. And let's remember that every time Republican says that they are independent and they don't take big money to nah, 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 and whether they're media figures like Ben Shapiro or whether they're politicians like Matt Gates, they're full of it. They're absolutely mm -hmm. full of it. We understand who funds them. It's largely the fossil fuel industry. It's the Wilkes brothers who made mass billions of dollars in fracking, uh, funding the Daily Wire. They are not independent. They're not small dollar donor run. This is not a Bernie Sanders, you know, $17 average 
average donor campaign, they all have, there is vested interest in stopping the government in order to slash any kind of public spending and funnel more and more money to the wealthy. Of course, we never saw this when it came to the $1.9 trillion tax break for the wealthy passed under Donald Trump. No, no, that's perfectly fine. That's spending we have. Final final piece on Matt Gates. He's a he's not a you know young upstart. He is the son of a politician named Don Gates. Don Gates, who absolutely is actually running again for state senate. He was in the state senate before. It looks like he's running again in the state of Florida. Matt Gates' political trail was not just preceded by, but heavily influenced by his father, a Republican multimillionaire businessman who had a reputation for rhetorical flourishes and drag out political fights. Don Gates all but paved the way for his son into Florida's political world. And some suggest his father's stature and influence is even helping his son as he faces a probe into potential sex trafficking. Yeah, you think, daddy? Look at him, look at his face. He is such a fail son. Daddy, I'm in trouble again, dad. So um, I Venmoed her money and I thought she was 18. Dad, dad, are you there? Like, come on. Um, so again, let's just remember that this is where this guy comes from. And um, I'll leave it at that and we'll cover, we'll cover more on Matt Gates because sadly he's not going anywhere. Um, but let's move to this guys. Um, Big news about the US-Mexico border, take a look. I'll answer one question on the border wall. The border wall, the money was appropriated for the border wall. I tried to get them to reappropriate, to redirect that money. They didn't, they wouldn't. And in the meantime, there's nothing under the law other than they have to use the money for what was appropriate. I can't stop that. Do you believe the border wall works? No. All right, that was President Biden answering questions about his move to waive 26 laws and allow more border wall to be built along the southern border of the United States. Um, Again, this is a massive reversal from candidate Biden who promised that there will not be another foot, I think was the quote of border wall constructed in his administration. Uh, And there he is saying that he had no choice um, he had to approve more construction on the border wall. Does he believe it works? No. So let's get into the details. Um, his excuse again about why he had to use the money. According to a notice posted to the Federal Register Wednesday, the construction of the wall will be paid for by already appropriated funds earmarked specifically for that physical border barrier. The administration was under a deadline to use them or lose them. But the move comes at a time when a new migrant surge is straining federal and local resources and placing heavily political heavy political pressure on the Biden administration to address a sprawling crisis. And the notice cited high illegal entry. Um, So use it or lose it. I would say lose it. Remember how you tried to stop Donald Trump and how this was the whole reason. You remember how you guys are at different parties in any way. But also um, this is Just further evidence that he doesn't think that it works um, physically. Like it doesn't work in stopping migrants from fleeing. Uh, They are gang ridden or poverty stricken countries. Um, We'll talk about that in a sec. But it does maybe stop Republicans from calling him, you know, uh, soft on immigrants, right? Or like, oh, he doesn't care about border security. But does it even do that? Yasmin, what do you make of this? Well, I had to use it. It was already there. There's nothing I can do, excuse. Yeah, so pretty much exactly what you said is what I took away from it. You know, I live in Texas. I'm in Houston, so it's not exactly a border town, but um, I hear a lot of people around these parts talking about how the borders in crisis and all these things are happening. I haven't seen it personally, but maybe that's just me. I live in a very small part of Texas. That said, Biden is in a position of optics, right? Like he he has a, an issue with optics, right? Whether or not there is a problem at the border, which you know maybe there is. We do need a solution as far as what to do with the people coming in through um from Mexico mm-hmm. into the United States, right? So deal with it. Like deal with that problem. The wall, as we know, as Biden even said himself, is not the solution. That's not what works. And the fact that they had to overwrite what was it 26 uh federal laws just to get this done 
is crazy. That's a lot of effort to do something just for the sake of optics, just to tell people or just to, you know, promote the illusion that you're tough on immigration, that you're tough on keeping Americans safe, whatever the talking point is at this point. Yeah. So I think he's trying to play politics. He's trying to play both sides. But at the same time, it's not really going to functionally make that much of a difference, as he said himself. So he still needs to do something. At least we know no more taxpayer money is going towards us. So that's a relief. But uh, it, it's still just a Band-Aid solution to a weird problem. And at the same time, he's alienating the people who voted for him in the first yeah. place. And he's up for re-election. And that shouldn't go unsaid or unnoticed. That's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, let's be real. Probably one of the biggest issues that people who were against Trump, who protested Trump, was around his treatment of migrants, was around his rhetoric around the border, right? That's the piece, that's basically the slogan of the Trump administration. And it's the one issue that Biden sadly has been in lockstep with the former administration on, right? Continuing to deny people asylum and now continuing to build the wall. Now, let's be real, guys. If you've been to the border, the US Mexico border, you know, there's a lot of fences. It might not be like a concrete wall, uh, but there's a lot of barriers there, right? Um, and, you know, we can talk about, let's just be real. No Republican is gonna give Joe Biden credit for continuing to build barriers or the wall, and whatnot. Some of those laws, the 26 laws have to do with imminent domain. They have to do with people's private property. The fact that the wall and these barriers will be built on that private property. It has to do with environmental regulations, the Rio Grande. It has a, the destruction that barriers cause and that a wall would cause to the Rio Grande River is massive. So this is, these are people, right? There are a lot of people and interestingly, we don't have to go down this road, but like a lot of the people living on the border say, yeah, there are folks who enter and leave, but I'm not being immediately threatened. I am more threatened by the militarism that is taking place thanks to Customs and Border Patrol and thanks to um, this border barrier and wall. But of course, Donald Trump is gonna take the, the, uh, the victory lap on this one. And he bleed, it's so interesting to watch crooked Biden break every environmental law in the book to prove that I was right. So you agree they're environmental laws. When I built 560 mil miles, they incorrectly state 450 in the story of brand new beautiful border wall. As I have stated often over a thousand years, there are only two things that have consistently worked, wheels and walls. That's a first dude, like I'm not like, for, like I follow your work, bro. Like I've li I've listened to all your albums and stuff. I've never heard wheels and walls from you. I've heard the windmills. Um, I've heard the toilets flushing. I've heard all the your, your other greatest hits. Never heard the wheels and walls though. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so there he goes on and on and on. Of course, rubbing it in honestly Democrats' face. Um, there's more bad news on the immigration front. Um, Biden resumed deportations of Venezuelan migrants, again, escaping a country that has faced massive um, economic hardship right now. Um, as well as, um, and Mayorkas, uh, the uh, Homeland Security Director um, discussed that. It's not good, y'all. There's more, um, and a lot of this was because the, the reason he's doing this is because he's faced pressure, not just from Republicans, but also from Democrats. You've got J.B. Pritzker of Chicago. You've got Eric Adams of New York. These are Democrats saying we can't handle the influx of migrants uh, currently. And um, all I have to say is, invest the money in those countries. Drop the sanctions on Venezuela. Stop uh, spending money to criminalize. The criminalized drugs, stop making the war on drugs a thing that is coming on the backs of, of civilians and innocent people. There's an idea, but hey, what do I know? Remember when the Supreme Court ruled that discrimination was a-okay, especially when it comes to LGBTQ plus people. Um, and that in this case, a Colorado wedding web designer could refuse to make a website for a gay couple. And remember how that case was like kind of weird and bogus, uh, just a refresher. That case involved a woman named Lori Smith. And she was helped by a group called the ADF or the Alliance Defending Freedom. Hold that thought, there's more on that. But remember how in that case, the man who she claimed asked for her services, a guy named Stewart, had no idea that he was even involved in this case. This was a quote from him about that case that 
I was incredibly surprised given the fact that I've been happily married to a woman for the last 15 years said Stewart who declined to give his last name for fear of harassment and threats. In other words, the entire case of the Supreme Court ruled on uh, effectively allowing people to discriminate against gay folks in this country was based on a lie. So what other lies have been told in the name of bigotry? Uh, there is more because according to a new Washington Post report, the Alliance Defending Freedom has a multi-decade history of fabricating cases uh, out of whole cloth. So let's look at this. Uh, among the wedding vendors that were represented by the Christian nonprofit Alliance Defending Freedom were a photographer from Kentucky, videographers from Minnesota, and a pair of Arizona artists who created stationery. Each challenged local laws barring businesses from discriminating based on sexuality, which a plaintiff said violated their First Amendment rights. But were they vendors? By an exam, an But an examination by the Washington Post of court filings, um, the company records and other materials found that two of the three vendors cited in the ADF September 2021 petition had stopped working on weddings and the other did not photograph any weddings for two years. Three additional vendors represented by ADF in similar lawsuits elsewhere also abandoned or sharply cut back their work on weddings after they sued local authorities for the right to reject same sex couples. Also, they established themselves only to disintegrate after they brought forward the case. But the craziest part is that things were actually staged by the ADF, ADF photographs were staged by the ADF to make it look like these people were truly who they said they were. So the ADF also had a hand in formally establishing the companies for some of the clients. The Post found lawyers associated with the legal group signed incorporation paperwork and helped draft company policies that were later used as a basis for the wedding lawsuits. And ADF promoted promoted some of its lawsuits with videos and images of plaintiffs photographing photographing women in bridal gowns at what the post found were stage events featuring ADF employees. Oh My word, so here's a photo of a plaintiff uh, that the ADF groomed for lack of a better uh, word from Wisconsin. And this is a publicity photo with who's that in the background? Oh, it looks like a bride. No, 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 she's an ADF employee. Since suing for the right to decline same-sex weddings, Lawson has removed the word photography from the name of her business, which now focuses on corporate branding. Yeah, so guys, all of these cases, at least the majority that the Post found are bogus. There is more, Um, I wanna jump down actually before I get to you, Yaz, uh, to this Kentucky woman um, who, was supposedly working out of Louisville, hadn't even established a photography business. The ADF helped her help her sign the LLC to establish a business. And the person who signed that paperwork was a lawyer for the Alliance Defending Freedom. After they signed that, after they brought the lawsuit in Kentucky, what happened? She moved to Florida. She just left the state altogether. Late last month, the ADF told the court, however, that Nelson, this is this, um, um, the Kentucky woman had photographed two weddings this summer, but neither of them were in Louisville. It filed copies of work contracts dated months after Louisville noted her absence from photograph, uh, photographing weddings. Customers' last names were redacted. The Post determined that the bride in the first wedding held in Mississippi in July was Nelson's sister-in-law. And then Nelson was also a guest according to the couple's wedding website. Okay, so you just you did photography for your sister, cool. The second wedding was held near Nelson's home in Tallahassee later that month. Speaking on the condition of anonymity to avoid being caught up in a legal dispute, the groom, a doctoral student from Nigeria, told the Post that he met Nelson through church. So who's to say that that's even real? I guess that technically counts as you are a wedding photographer for your sister and then a dude that you met at the church. Neither of those uh, uh, like instances and neither of those weddings happened in the state in which you're bringing your lawsuit, which is Kentucky. Yasmin, these are the cases that are making their way all the way up to the Supreme Court. The ADF had started this way back when, and um, here we are suffering the consequences of phantom cases that never existed in the first place. Yeah, so a lot of this, first of all, puts into very stark perspective the fact that you know we have these people who are appointed to the higher court, the highest court in the entire land. 
and they're supposed to be the most just people. They're supposed to be, you know, able to look at both sides of an argument and determine what is the best for everybody and what is the most just, what's the most ethical. And they're simply unable to do that because they're operating with a flawed set of, um, with flawed data, right? And they know it, they have to know it. And if they don't know it, then they're bad at their jobs and they shouldn't be on that bench in the first place. Conversely, in a weird way, this actually makes me feel kind of good because whenever things like this come up in the news and whenever cases like this make it to the Supreme Court, it's kind of sad to think that your fellow Americans are these people, you know, and that, you know, this is kind of the way the country is going or that's the way it can seem. It's nice to know that they ha- still have to pull all these tricks and just like come up with all these fake cases because they don't actually exist in the real world. So it makes me feel better about like the people that I'm sharing a country with, which is a weird thing to take comfort in because functionally the Supreme Court still is going to do what they're going to do. But at least I know that there's solidarity with the American people that we all think this is crazy. Yeah. Uh I am at a crossroads. Shall we squeeze one more story? Let's do this. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> yes, I hear you, girl. Um, let's talk about this. Um, so, a new study has come out that has shown that the myth around decriminalizing drugs is actually not reality. In fact, decriminalizing drugs doesn't worsen overdoses or contribute to more violent crime. That's according to a New York University Grossman School of Medicine study published in JAMA Psychiatry that looked at a year's worth of overdose data in Oregon and Washington that both had decriminalized drugs in 2021, found no evidence linking an increase in overdose deaths to those those decriminalization policies. What's interesting about this study, however, is that it didn't find that the overdose deaths went down. Okay, they remained effectively the same. Um, In fact, they I mean, they didn't plateau, they did go up, but they went up on par with the stats that were around the country. So let's jump down here to um, uh, graphic four. While overdoses didn't go up in the states because of decriminalization, they still went up. Organs went from 18.7 per 100,000 people to 26.8 per 100,000 people, while Washington went from 22 per 100,000 people to 28.1 per 100,000 people in 2020 and 2021. But the study compared the state's increases with a control group made up of data from similar states that didn't decriminalize drugs and found the differences weren't statistically significant. In other words, overdoses are going up no matter what. The decriminalization policies were not part of that. And the other thing I'll say with this, specifically in Oregon, a lot of the harm reduction policies that were implemented alongside the decriminalization hadn't taken effect yet before this study was complete. What was taking place is the fact that fentanyl has been basically released onto the streets and has claimed so many lives. So the overdoses are of course going up. Um, This is according to someone who worked on the study. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to just go back this. Uh, He says this is Um, This is from Corey Davis, uh, part of it. He says, you can definitely overdose and die on cocaine or methamphetamine, but it's not as prevalent as overdosing and dying on opioids. But fentanyl, which initially was more prominent in the East, has now infiltrated the drug supply all over the country. It's so cheap and available that people are starting to use fentanyl who didn't before. Davis said the contaminated drug supply is the main problem, but discussing discussion of having a safe drug supply uh, is a political non-starter. In other words, fentanyl could be regulated, we could stop overdoses easily, no matter what the decriminalization laws are, that criminalizing fentanyl will not help, but it is a political non-starter. Yasmin, just weigh in here on on this new data. So I think what this issue does is it really puts into very, um, you can really see it very clearly, something that happens with a lot of issues in this country. There's the science and then there's, you know, like, how do we help people? How do we actually make things better? How do we actually uh, run the country in a way that's effective and efficient and operational and safe for people and also grants people the freedoms to make decisions over their own life? And then there's the politicization of all of that, right? There's data and then there's politics and they're, they should work hand in hand together. But so often we find that they just don't. Yes. And in this case, we see that there is data that supports, you know, decriminalizing doesn't necessarily increase overdoses. We have the data to support that. But at the same time, people are still going to take those hard numbers, maybe take them out of context, maybe just say, 
but it still went up and, you know, not understand the way statistics and the way that sample sizes and things like that work. Absolutely. And the politics, they don't really care about all the details and things like that. They just need a sound bite. They just need something to put out to the American people and say, look, it went up, so we shouldn't have it anymore. Even Absolutely. though, you know, with, with gun deaths and things like that, they don't tend to apply the same kind of logic. 100%. This is such a massive story and I hope we continue to cover it and we will. Um, but that is the time that we have for our first hour. There is more in the aftermath. Yasmin Khan, Francesca Fiorentini here with you. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you very soon. Hold on to your butts. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.